Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 731. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 10th, 2022. All right, welcome to the pollen capital of the world. We're here in Florida. George is in Central Florida. I'm in Southern Florida, just outside of Miami. And I've been suffering for a couple of weeks now, George, of all this pollen you have down here. I'm not used to it with my Midwest Northeastern raising. Uh, so I may sound a little congested. I think I have a sinus thing flaring up here or there. And so please excuse me, George and I tried to do a taping about half an hour ago, but he was having work right down outside of his office. And so all we heard was pounding and sawing and sawzalls. So I think we can start a good program now, George. How's it going up there in Central Florida? It is beautiful, joyful. I've got a wedding at two o'clock. I'm looking forward to a wonderful couple. I uh, did a last rites at the hospital this before the show. Uh, there's no better life than being a parish priest. There really isn't. It's just sure. wonderful. You're there at the beginning and the end, and mm-hmm. and it's even better when you're in a place for a long time because you grow with people as they grow. Absolutely. Uh, we are transitioning. We left the keys where we had our vacation, and now we're back to our work mode. And we're going up to Webster for a couple of days, and then we're headed to Red Bay, Alabama, to get some upgrades for the Tiffin. So, without further ado, let's move on to the news, and there's lots and lots of stories. In fact, this is probably going to be the most news individual story section of Anglican Unscripted we've ever done. i got ten in front of me. And let's start off with the Australian Synod is going to discuss, debate, and have amongst them a, hopefully a godly discussion, on same-sex marriage. This has been an ongoing discussion for uh, many synods down there, George. Um, and I'm noticing this time the moderates have uh, got the the press on their side. So let's talk a little about what's going on down there. Well, there are three parties in this debate at General Synod. There's the liberals, there are the conservatives, and then there's the press. Mm -hmm. The week before General Synod, the Australian and the Sydney Morning Herald have run articles that basically smack the conservatives for being basically MAGA-inspired right-wing troglodytes. Uh-huh. while the, those who are pro-gay marriage are the moderates trying to bring the church into the 21st century. What are we, in the 20, 21st century? First, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, my. And uh, in the past, change in the Australian church has not really come through synod, uh, controversial items. I'm thinking of uh, women priests. Uh, women priests were blocked in the synod until the appellate tribunal gave a ruling saying grammatically speaking uh men means men and women and there's really no reason why we can't go forward with women priests even though general senator said no so women priests came through a legal decision well the appellate tribunal has all again ruled that gay marriage is a second order issue it's not something that should divide or split the church and we can agree to disagree well The conservatives and liberals, I don't think are happy going that route again. They each side wants a clear, unambiguous statement on this point. So the liberals are pushing hard for the recognition of same-sex marriage. That, and the arguments are ones we've heard all the time. This is a modern age. The Bible doesn't mean what it appears to mean. People didn't know about loving, faithful, homosexual relationships, so on and so forth. If church has changed its mind before on other issues, it can change its mind on issues. Well, the conservatives point out that none of those things are true, are true. or relevant <laughs> to the debate. Yes. Now, the difference between the US, England, and Australia is that in Australia, the Diocese of Sydney is the gorilla in the room. It's a behemoth compared to the other dioceses, except maybe for Melbourne, which is divided on this issue. Melbourne has a very strong conservative contingency but Sydney is nearly unanimous on this point, and they probably can hold off the charge and beat it back. Because there's some bishops who've already gone ahead and authorized or sort of uh, wink, wink, nod, nod, not done anything when gay marriages take place, I think Sydney wants a clean decision on this point, and 
David Old, our partner in uh, crime, is uh, live blogging the Synod. We've been publishing his stories as well as the stories of Russell Powell from Sydney. And we'll see what happens. But it's really an exciting time uh, when, and somebody's clever in that they're getting the press to sort of leverage the people inside the room at General Synod to well, do what they want. We saw that here with general conventions as well over the last uh, uh, many years where the, the press would be on the side of the liberals. And I remember attending the 2009 uh, uh, General Synod where uh, the CBS, NBC, and all had their satellites out, and it was the, the reasonable liberals versus the, the uh, uh, Nazi conservatives. And so I don't expect too much different down there. The problem is the discussion never ends. If the, the conservatives hold the day and uh, same sex marriage uh, does not uh, grasp into the church, they'll have to have this discussion at the next general senate. It, the, the, it never ends, George. Well, yes, you're right. I agree with that pros proposition. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think demography is destiny. The liberal ch meaning that uh, population growth and population decline rules the future. The evangelical dioceses are growing. They're strong. They're positive. They're popular. The liberal dioceses are fading away very quickly, just mm -hmm. like in the United States. Sure, absolutely. I see that. So, so that... Uh, I, I expect one day that my diocese will be bigger than the diocese of, say, Massachusetts or Virginia, the old mainstream diocese with 100,000 plus people. Uh -huh. uh, give it time, but you know, with, I think uh, demo demography is on our, is on quote, our side. Uh, and I think this in the long term is going to be one that way. Dioceses that proclaim abortion as a blessing are, are just being wiped out where conservative dioceses uh, have a little bit of staying power in this day and age. Let's move on to, and nobody's going to be surprised by this, the Church of England has not just been bad the last five years. The Church of England has done bad things a hundred years ago, 500 years ago, even 800 years ago. And I was surprised to read Justin Welby uh, put together an apology tour for something that they did 800 years ago. And in my mind's eye, if you're going to apologize for anything, it's you can apologize to the Jews, and I'm not going to complain about it. George, let's talk about the story where uh, King Edward I uh, kicked out all the Jews because of something the Church of England did. Let's, let's bring people up to speed. On Saturday, at a service at Christ Church Cathedral in Oxford, a representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury asked the Jews for forgiveness in the form of asking the Chief Rabbi of Britain for forgiveness for the decrees of the Synod of Oxford in 1222. The, decree, the Synod of Oxford was the Synod of the Church in England, which was at that time part of under the papacy, where it carried out the decisions of the Second Lateran Council of 1215. And among those decisions at the Diocese Synod of Oxford were Jews had to wear distinctive markings on their clothing, akin to the yellow star the Nazis forced Jews to wear. Jews could engage in only in certain practices. They could be money lenders. They couldn't be farmers, for instance. Jews uh, could not build new synagogues. Jews and Christians could not socialize. And these uh, restrictions sort of began a series of anti-Semitic uh, worldview for the medieval English people that led to things like the blood libel, that the matzahs are made out of the blood of murdered Christian babies and things, culminating in Edward I, 68 years after the Synod of Oxford, expelling the Jews. So. Justin Welby apologized for the decrees of the Lateran Council and the decrees of the Synod of Oxford. Now, hypothetically, I think that's a good thing. I agree with you, Kevin. Uh, the Jews have been a target of Christian anti-Semitism for a very long time. But they are still a target of the Church of England. Yes, and I think that's, that's to me, the hypocrisy there. Justin Welby is happy to apologize something Edward I did and the Synod of Oxford did 800 years ago, 
But at the same time, the Church of England uh, Synod is happy to smack Israel, get involved in the boycott, divest, sanctions, campaigns of the hard left. And you can demonize Israel, you can demonize the Jews uh, by not forcing them to wear yellow stars. Uh, you can demonize them as they're being demonized in Europe and in England today. And the Church of England is part of the chorus cheering on the demonization. When I worked for the Jerusalem Post, I remember writing an article uh, where I interviewed George Carey, who was the just, just then former Archbishop of Canterbury, Ron Williams had taken over. And George Carey said that, you know, recent sanctions and no business with companies that do business in the West Bank or Gaza, he said, you know, that's just blatant anti-Semitism. And good thing that the church is recognizing the injustices done in the past, but it's blind to the injustices that it's doing today, I believe. Right, same here. Same with uh, the Episcopal Church. Uh, their general conventions are generally very anti-Semitic. Now, there have been recent stories about, uh, well, actually, we're a party to that case, so I think we can't say anything. Okay, <laughs> no problem. So let's move on to uh, uh, Church of England as well. Uh, as many of you know, the Church of England has run out of priests, and some of uh, the parishes are served, uh, you know, one priest will serve two, three, four, five, six parishes, and they have a solution, George. Their solution is to take pensioners and make them priests. And they know they need to do this rapidly. So they're talking not a three or four year uh, clerical degree, but something done in months. We need to talk about that. <laughs> yes, the Church of England is introducing 90 day wonders. Well, it's actually 365 day wonders, yes. one year of training uh, to uh, buck up the ranks of the priesthood. Uh, the, the Church Revitalization Trust has running a program where they're inviting form retirees who are former lay Eucharistic ministers, church wardens, and involved in the church in some way that they're Christian, which is a good thing. Good and start. who also have, uh, you know, and also Christians who are former policemen, teachers, social workers, bankers, people who have, uh, you know, uh, interaction with the public and basically have something a head between their shoulders. And they're going to train them for a year, and then if the bishop accepts them, they'll be ordained to the priesthood. That's compared to the university, being an undergraduate university, then going to three years of theological school. And these 90-day wonders will essentially be used to sort of help uh, the embattled clergy, like the felt people we talk about who have seven, eight parishes to serve. Um, they may get two or three of these guys to help out. Now, I think from a management idea, yeah, this is not a bad idea. But at the same token... <laughs> oh, <laughs> killer. <laughs> yes, for you, you keep me safe now, boy. Oh, my. He at sees the, the word we're leaving who we're... Uh... Oh, that's cute. Oh, my. What? It must be very frustrating to have to spend seven, eight years in training. And while you're training, take all these stupid classes on diversity and, you know, sensitivity Virtual training, signaling and, all this yeah. stuff. Now, of course, you don't get any practical classes on how to manage a church's budget, how to raise money, all this and that. Um, but you take all these waste of time classes and these people don't have to do that. They just learn the straight stuff they need to know. So there's a bit of envy on the other hand, on one side, but at the same time, will these priests be fully formed priests? Um, can you just churn out a priest, an effective priest, in 365 days? The, the program is being run by the St. Miletus uh, Theological College in London, I think on a correspondence basis. They've already had the first 10 graduates, and there are 100 new ones in the pipeline right now. So this is growing quickly. 10 first year, 100 second year, and we'll see where it goes. Well, if I were a clergy person who went through the whole rigmarole to get my degree, my complaint would be they only have one year of training, and then they're going to be at the, the bishop's beck and call because they, you know, 
his authority over them would be much more than his authority over me, so to speak. Right. Yeah, these guys aren't going to be paid, and so and but they're not going to have any sort of tenure, any sort of protections of office. Mm-hmm. They basically function at the pleasure of the bishop. And so a sense, uh, as there's an editorial in the English churchman that was strongly condemning this practice because it was going to turn out monkey see, monkey do priests. These priests are going to follow the lead of the bishop in everything. And the problem is, what if you have a bad bishop? What if you have in the a Church of England? Jo- I, I know, I know, I know, Kevin, we shouldn't be shocked by that. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're amplifying the bad aspects of the Church of England without strengthening the good. Mm-hmm. And one of the good is the independence and professional standing and status of the clergy. And if you're taking that away to basically make mass functionaries, people can say a good mass, turning, uh, turning out a generation of Father Ted priests. Um, but Well, we'll see how it works, but uh, I'm not confident. I'm not either. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some other news. The ACNA has a new traditional language prayer book, which in my realm is good news. I don't think I would use it, but uh, for those who want to know, traditional language is the, the King James version of the prayer book, the these, thous, and thoses. And uh, um, I think it's good news. Yeah, we got a press release from Jacob Hootman and Suzanne Gill from the Diocese of Fort Worth. Hootman's a priest. Suzanne Gill is a longtime friend of ours, who's the communications director. And in June, they're going. Bishop Brian Reed is going to be launching this prayer book at a uh, church service. Now, when the ACNA prayer book came out, there were some who complained that this was just a warmed-over Episcopal seventy-nine prayer book. And they wanted more of the 1928 language of the Episcopal prayer book. Uh, so wonderful phrases like, we miserable offenders. I, I like that phrase too. Okay. Along uh, with the these and the thous and the majesty of the uh, language of the generation of Shakespeare, Elizabethan uh-huh. English. Well, after several years work, they've come up with one that essentially t- is holds to the same doctrine as the a current ACNA prayer book, but is cast in language that is reflective of the Anglican form, Anglican traditional prayer books. So this is this is a labor of love. Nobody's getting rich off this prayer book. You don't have to buy it from your church. No. But this will be very welcome in some places. And as you say, Kevin, in uh, C4SO, I don't think they're going to sell many copies. But uh, we'll see. Uh, but, it's a just... step, it, but to me, if I go to the deeper level, it's a positive step forward of a church that is confident of itself. Yes, absolutely. I because this isn't this is this isn't just the, the problem with liturgists is that liturgists are the nastiest human beings you've ever met. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I know some grammar people that are really you know. Literature not liturgy Nazis, Nazis are not yes. pleasant people. <laughs> well, this is not the product of liturgy Nazis. This is the product of working priests yes. who are not doing this out of a vanity project, but do want to do this so as to glorify God mm-hmm. in their worship. So, I, I this is a good development for the ACNA, and I'm and I'm pleased to see it happen. And I I do agree because one of the longest meetings I ever attended. And this is before the ACNA. This is back when there was an ACN uh, back in Pittsburgh. I was in a room of priests, and somebody, I don't know why, started the discussion on which was the greatest prayer book. And I lost two hours of my life just like that. And you'll never get it back. You'll never never get it back. Never get it back. Oh, my Lord. And in a room of 200 priests, there were 200 distinct individual opinions on what the greatest prayer book was. Well, oh, they yeah. didn't actually come up with the right answer because I wasn't there to give you were there, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, here, it, it, in the show comments, tell us what is your favorite prayer book. Uh, you know, give you something to talk oh, about. Oh, Kevin, you're opening the door. You're opening <laughs> the door. <laughs> and you must defend it. Um, let's move on and talk about the Di- Diocese of South Carolina. Uh, officially, we've read that the Diocese of South Carolina is not going to seek a rehearing in the decision for the Supreme Court of South Carolina. Um, but some individual churches might. What's the story there, George? Uh, the president of the Standing Committee and Bishop Chip Edgar released a letter 
uh, stating that the diocese would not seek a rehearing of the South Carolina Supreme Court decision, which essentially, in Alan Haley's words, split the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, half the churches went to the Anglican diocese, little less than half went to the Episcopal diocese. Now, Bishop, the, the letter basically saying is, you know, we need to come to finality and we don't think we need to go forward with this. However, we note that some individual parishes may seek to continue the fight. And about, I believe, eight parishes uh, are going to seek a rehearing uh, because they're all individually litigants in this case. I was given a copy of the letter that Old St. Andrews in Charleston sent to its parishioners. They're going to uh, continue the fight because they say, you know, the exact language and wording of the decision that put them in the Episcopal camp uh, is so hazy and fuzzy that they th that they think they can get that overturned. Sure. So they're confident that they can, well, I don't want to say confident, but they're expressing confidence to their people not to give in, not to walk away, not to do this or that. Now, the Episcopal Diocese has been silent through all of this. And I'm hoping, I don't know this, but I'm hoping that there's some conversations uh, that we're not privy to that really will seek uh, a final determination, maybe leasing back properties and this and that, because, oh, just all the money spent and all the time lost dealing with lawyers when it could be, when that energy could be devoted to building the kingdom of God. Yeah. Th this yes, is, injustice has been done. And injustice has been done. I think absolutely. you and I admit that. No, absolutely. But, it's, but there's sometimes in life you just have to go forward with the injustice. There is an injustice. At some point, the injustice becomes a distraction for the growth of the church. And I think we're, we're getting to that point now where um, just we got to move on. Now, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to see a bunch of empty Episcopal churches. It, you know, if they if they're winning these churches, it's not going to be filled with Episcopalian or you know. So enough to, enough discussing on that, George. Let's talk about uh, the. Ooh, oh, I had it right here. Go to my show notes. The Anglican Church in Europe had a synod, and the Free Church of England had a synod. Kind of a uh, uh, little bit of a uh, different type of synod, George. One's growing, one's shrinking. Uh, it's Anglican Convocation in Europe, I think it is. Hold on, I, um, I think you're right. Yes, sorry. Anglican Convocation in Europe held their synod, uh, the first one post-COVID where everybody can come in person, up in, uh, was it Glasgow or Edinburgh? Someplace far to the north where it snows all the time, in Scotland. And Bishop Andy Lyons uh, spoke to the synod, and the mood was positive. There is slow, positive growth for the ACE. Uh, they had a number of visiting clergy who basically wanted to scope it out to see is this a place they want to where they wish to jump. And the ACE is not growing as fast as the Anglican Church in North America did, but it's different, different ground, less fertile ground, uh, different, uh, you can't compare the two apples to oranges, but the ACE is there to stay. It looks like this is going to be successful. This seed is growing. Now, we contrast this to the Free Church of England Synod recently. And I think the picture of the 2018 clergy in attendance and the 2022 clergy in attendance really tells the story. Nine clergy have left the FCE since 2018. Some for the ACE, others for different places. And those that remain are old and tired, and the FCE is just in a difficult spot. Uh, last year, we Anglican Inc. comment section was uh, a, alive. <laughs> a, a, a battlefield between supporters and opponents, <clears throat> the primus of the FCE, yeah. who was accused of uh, fiddling with money meant you know, closed churches, taking that money to prop up the FCE's administration, whereas the money should have gone, according to the trusts, uh, for charitable purposes. And the FCE is 
in a spiral down. And I, well, my opinion is that uh, it's lost its largest eye since the Brazilians walked out. Um, it's lost all of its young clergy, dynamic clergy. Now, there's nothing wrong with being old. Kevin, I like being old. Uh, <laughs> I don't, things ache. I, I, when I walk, I sound like snap, crackle, pop, but being old is cool. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with being old, but you're less likely to attract young people to your church the older you are. Mm -hmm. So we've got a story of success, cautious success and a story of mm, sadness. Sure. Things don't look too good for the SCE. No, they don't. But yeah. I hope they can prove me wrong and totally idiotic. <laughs> Please do. All right. One final story. Oh, we got more than that, Kevin. We got lots more. What? I just have a. Uh, we got uh, London uh, embezzlement, got, yeah, that's French the, pastor that's murdered, and the uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Nigeria response oh, to. Oh, I don't uh, write that. Okay. We'll do the communique next. Okay, so there was a primates meeting held in London a couple of weeks ago. They put out a communique and saying, we, we really miss the people who couldn't be here. Well, the people who couldn't be there have written a, a response to that, and I thought we could talk about that, George. Yes, the primates of Nigeria, Rwanda, and Uganda, mm -hmm. who make up the three largest provinces, I believe, of the Anglican Communion oh, yep. in terms of attendance. Church of England is technically the largest because if you're not a Catholic in England or a Muslim, you're a member of the Church of England. But in terms of worship, they're fairly, sm they're much smaller. Uh, they comprise at least half of the worshipers every Sunday in the Anglican world, those three churches. Their primates released a letter saying, how hypocritical of you to say this letter that we're sorry that you couldn't make it, blah, 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 when you know exactly why we didn't come. It's because these shows are boondoggles. Yes. They basically are, you know, meet and greet and have sherry and get visits from important people in England, people who in England think are important people, but aren't really that important. And we talk about mosquito nets and how, you know, we must love each other and our diversity and all that good stuff when the force is tearing apart the church and the world are uniformly ignored or papered over. Um, so we're not coming to Lambeth, they said. We're not bowing our knees to the uh, new colonialists in London who are telling us what to think and how to believe and how to organize our churches and societies. We believe that the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn. Uh, I mentioned this about the Church of Wales, Church in Wales last week is being withdrawn. The GAFCON primates believe it's already out the door for England sure. and Canada and the Church of England, uh, as well as the Welsh and the Brazilians and the Scots, and various places. Um, so it, it really was a stern rebuke and they're looking uh, to next year's Kigali conference uh, where they're going to invite, they'll be there, plus those in the Global South movement and the GAFCON movement to come and renew and revigorate and plan for the future the Anglican way. One of the things that it wasn't actually mentioned in the communique but has been a topic of conversation is why should the Archbishop of Canterbury be the de facto first among equals in the Anglican world. The Archbishop of Canterbury is appointed by the British Prime Minister. Um, why should Britain, is this the last vestige of the British Empire? And why should that be? Why should uh, the primates not choose amongst themselves? Why do we have to uh, make obeisance and a bow to the decisions of civil servants in the UK. An incredible point and something that really needs, it's, the time has come. The time has uh, come to change the leadership of the Anglican Communion. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we've just seen, you know, the last 20 years, the slow decline, slow, rapid decline of the church. And a lot of that is because of the leadership and the instruments of unity that have been 
uh, throw it in their faces. So it's time. All right, George, you mentioned it. Um, our, what I thought was going to be our last story would be missing money in the Diocese of London. And do you want to do the French murders or not? Uh, yeah, let's do it because it's important. Uh, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was Sri Lanka, right? No, no, Guyana, Guyana. other side of the world. <laughs> Did I miss the pre- I missed the pre-show? I he's like, was I not a part of the pre-show? And so, yes, yeah, so let's talk about the, the the murder of the French priest George. A French Protestant pastor mm-hmm. was murdered, and his church burned to the ground this week in Guyana, French Guyana, which is on the South American mainland. It's a department of France. It's as much as part of France as Hawaii is the United States. This Mm -hmm. murder and arson Mm -hmm. took place after a delegation from the French uh, National Association of Evangelicals visited. And they're talking about how the churches can help with the uh, laws, the French secular laws that are seeking to combat militant Islam and no no arrests have been made the police are looking in a certain section of society the jihadists who live in french guiana who are responsible they believe are responsible for this murder and for the arson of the church because this man dared to uh, uh, say that militant islam must be confronted and pushed back now this is all this is all in a piece of the beheadings we had, I think it was two years ago, of the Catholic priest in uh, in northern France. Yeah. And the this last year has see, seen a spate of arson fires across France caused by Islamists, uh, Christian Catholic churches, Protestant churches being destroyed by a militant Islamist set fire. Um, cathedrals set alight. I'm not even talking about the cathedral in Paris, Notre Dame. I'm talking about provincial cathedrals sure. and things of it, that nature. Was, They've not uh, been burned down because the police have gotten that, the fire brigade has gotten in time to put out the fire. But these are being done by French Muslims or immigrant Muslims. It was six or seven years ago we had the uh, uh, shooting at the magazine, Charlie, what was it called? Charlie um, Hedbo, yes. Yeah, Hedbo. So, you know... It, so France uh, is really coming to a head. The, uh, an extraordinary letter came out, I think it was last year, where a collection of retired French generals said, look, unless we take a stand again and push back against militant Islam right now, we are going to have a civil war in this country. Mm-hmm. We're going to see the Algerian, the violence and ferocity of the Algerian civil war where France tried to keep its colony but pulled out because the cost was too high. We're going to see that in the Banlieus, uh, which are the Muslim residential suburbs around the big cities. We're going to see that yeah. unless we take action now. So that it doesn't look good for civil society in France right now. All right, George. Now can we go to the final story? <laughs> Stop the Indian corruption? No, no, no. I, 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 it's, it's like I, I just... I, I don't know. My age. We were just talking about age a minute ago. I dazed out on that story. I don't know. It wasn't even in the show notes. Final story. There's corruption about. I'm not surprised. But we're not talking about somebody who's just using his uh, uh, account to buy an extra martini at lunch. This is this is a major uh, amount of missing money, George. We can only tell you what we're going to distinguish between what we know as yes. to be true mm-hmm. and the rumors. What we know to be true is that on May 5th, the uh, chairman of the London Diocesan Fund and the general secretary sent a letter to church wardens and incumbents and treasurers to the churches in the city deanery, as well as to the incumbents in the Diocese of London, saying that they were investigating a historic fraud that took place with some of the funds Uh, used uh, from the historic city churches. Uh, The city of London... When you say historic fraud, you don't mean something happened 10 years ago. No, uh, but it was over a long period of time. Got it. Uh, It didn't happen last week uh, because it it was caught by the auditors. Okay. Uh, The 2021 Audit Committee found something funny 
they passed it to the police. The police have been investigating and there we can stop with what we know because we have a copy of the confidential letter sent to the incumbents and treasurers and church wardens. The rumors are, and with this we cannot know, uh, is that an arrest has been made and the person arrested is a senior figure and the person, you know, his name has been given to us, but we can't possibly say it because if we're wrong, uh, Alan, even Alan Haley won't get us off on that. No, 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 no. Uh, we're not going to say who it is, but this person recently retired and was a senior person in authority over the funds of the diocese. And the rumor is that over two million pounds has been stolen. That's the a lot of money. And the insurance companies have been notified, and someone is working with the police, we're told, to help with this. So we're talking, as you, Kevin said, we're not talking about fiddling your discretionary account to pay for a few extra lunches. We're talking about systematic, massive fraud that took place over a number of years, meaning historic. Sure. And it's now only been teased out. So this, when it hits the news, it hasn't hit this. I kept looking for the news. I keep looking at the arrest records for the Metropolitan Police to see if there's a news release or something. They haven't published it out there. And so only fact fact I have is this email. Uh, but there is talk. And if any of our viewers in the Diocese of London know anything more, tell us. Oh, absolutely. We'll have, have, yeah. have yeah. to take this further. Sure. But Kevin, I think this is. You know, how long has Sarah Mullally been there? Three, four years? Um, evidently, it began before she was there. Um, but I don't know that. Yes. But, but what I can guess is that she's going to take the hit squarely between the eyes because they always blame the person in charge. person in charge gets the glory and the blame when it breaks on their watch. The buck stops here, so to speak. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, will the buck stop here with them? Or will we get one of these lessons have been learned and we need to hire 10 more auditors to make sure nobody steals and increase the bureaucracy and close some more churches to pay for uh, people to do drone work? Drone work, indeed. So, so, friends, if you know anything, let us know. And watch for the news, because this is going to break, because it, the police are involved and... I understand uh, it's tied into the, I think it's Griffin or Griffiths, the priest who committed suicide with the bullying. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, I don't know how it's tied in, right. but that's been mentioned to me, but I, I don't know. Uh, rumors. It could be wrong. There could be UFOs involved. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Church of England, that's a possibility, George. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 731 of Anglican Unscripted.